Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're doing Epic History TV's World War One Part 1, 1914. Let's get into it. Nineteen fourteen. The great powers of Europe are divided into two rival alliances. The Triple Entente. France, Britain and Russia, united by fear and suspicion of Germany, Europe's new strongest power. And the Triple Alliance. Germany, which fears encirclement by its rivals. Austro-Hungary, clinging on to a fragile empire. And Italy, seeking gains at French expense. The spark comes on the 28th of June in the city of Sarajevo. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated by a 19-year-old Slav nationalist named Gavrilo Princip. Austro-Hungary accuses its Balkan rival Serbia of having aided the assassin and sends an ultimatum demanding humiliating concessions. Okay, so... First of all, there's a lot of evidence that points to Serbia did have a hand in that. Maybe not the entire government, like maybe it didn't have the sanction of the Serbian government, but it certainly looks like there were people within the Serbian government that were supporting these groups, that group in, uh, specifically. Also, the reason that France and Russia not so much Russia, but France really. France and Britain are really afraid of Germany. Germany, up until not quite this point, but a little before this point, under the toolage of Otto von Bismarck, was actually friends with Russia. That was kind of Bismarck's European diplomacy game, was keep the Russians happy. As long as the Russians are on our side, then we can't be encircled and everything's good here. So the Germans and the Russians were allies for quite a while leading up to this point, but, you know, things happen and specifically Germany gets a new ruler, Kaiser Wilhelm, and he decides he's going to basically do everything opposite of what Bismarck did. He wants to be his own leader, be his own man, and... So then Russia allies with France, and then Germany's encircled, which is exactly what Bismarck didn't want to happen. But Dan Carlin, in, in one of his podcasts, does a really good job of laying out why everybody is afraid of Germany right here. There, imagine today if the EU, as a economic system, decided that at midnight tonight they were going to sign paperwork that made all of the EU countries, not just one economic system, one solid country, one military system, one economic system, one global force, if you will. That's essentially what happens with Germany. Germany does not exist. They win the, the Franco-Prussian War, and then there are agreements and treaties signed at uh, Versailles that bring Germany into existence. And so immediately you have the greatest European power just show up. And so if you're France, you look up, you wake up one morning and there is this massive now military power, economic power, trade power. They have basically just popped up on your front doorstep. And so Everybody is afraid of Germany and what Germany is and could become. Germany, on the other hand, is upset that they are not getting to take part in the privileges of being a great modern nation at this time. They point at places like, uh, well, they point at the Dutch specifically and say, look, the, the Dutch have colonies all over the place. We don't have any colonies. We're not allowed colonies. and But the Dutch are? Like, that doesn't make any sense. We could wipe the Dutch off the face of the earth tomorrow. 
And so you basically have Germany trying to take its place on the world stage, everybody else kind of trying to big brother Germany, Russia, who has been big brothered a lot in their history. That's one of the reasons that Germany and Russia uh, find each other as allies initially. But again, that falls apart as you as you go along. Serbia rejects the ultimatum, and Austro-Hungary declares war. Within hours, Austrian forces are shelling Belgrade. The Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, feels honor bound to defend Serbia, a fellow Slav nation, and orders the Russian army to mobilize. German Emperor Wilhelm II has promised his support to Austro-Hungary. He and his generals see conflict with Russia as inevitable, and the sooner the better, as Russian strength grows year on year. Russian mobilization is used to justify German mobilization, followed by a declaration of war on Russia. Germany knows war with Russia means war with Russia's ally, France. It has developed the Schlieffen Plan to meet this threat of a war on two fronts. First, its armies will advance rapidly through neutral Belgium to encircle and destroy French armies near Paris and win a quick victory. Then its forces can move east to deal with Russia, whose huge army will take much longer to mobilize. And so Germany declares war on France. Six. This definitely is not a bad idea. The Schlieffen Plan is, is overall a good strategical idea because of what happens later in the war with Russia. You see that if they could actually knock France out, they probably win this war if it's just France and Russia. However, obviously Britain gets in and then later the US gets in, but also France is much more of a thorn in the side of the Germans than they expected them to be. But the plan is overall a decently good one. However, there are a lot of German generals after the war who are livid that the Schlieffen plan was not followed to a T. Here's the thing. When these plans are drawn up and war games are done prior to a military engagement, there are things that you just can't account for. And to give you an example of that, how do you gauge the exhaustion level of your troops whenever you're doing, you know, pre-war game plans and battle plans and you're doing your war games? How do you take into account, like you can take into account food, but how do you take into account how tired they are? How far, you know, can they push before they just can't push any further? And so there are, are a lot of generals post-war from Germany who are very upset that the younger von Molke did not follow the plan precisely. I have a hard time buying that because he's trying to implement it in real life versus you know, theoretically, but it's what they argue. A million men are now marching to war across Europe. Italy, however, remains neutral. The terms of the Triple Alliance don't bind it to join an offensive war. The United States also declares its neutrality. President Wilson and the American public have no desire to get entangled in Europe's war. Britain is France's ally, but at first it's not clear if it will join the war against Germany. But when German troops invade Belgium, whose neutrality Britain has guaranteed, an ultimatum is sent from London to Berlin, demanding they withdraw. It's ignored, and Britain declares war. There are a lot of historians that argue that that was a bad move by Britain that they should have sent this ultimatum before Germany actually invades Belgium so that it leaves Germany more maneuverability on what to do. Once they're actually moving troops through Belgium and then Belgium is fighting and it turns into a war, once they're in Belgium and they receive that, that notice from Britain, they really don't have any other option. They're already in Belgium and this is a race against the clock of mobilization here and so they don't have much choice.
a British expeditionary force lands in France, while the German invasion is held up for crucial days by Belgian resistance at the fortress city of Liège. German troops commit several massacres against Belgian civilians. The atrocities are inflated by Allied propaganda and help turn public opinion in neutral countries against Germany. France, unaware of Germany's great encircling attack, launches Plan 17, an offensive into German territory. But in the Battle of the Frontiers, they're driven back with enormous losses on both sides. The British expeditionary force clashes with the German army at Mons, but the British are heavily outnumbered and soon join the French in retreat. The Allies make their stand at the River Marne, 40 miles outside Paris. Their desperate counterattack saves the city and drives the Germans back. Both sides suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The race to the sea begins as both sides try to outflank each other to the north. A series of clashes leads to the First Battle of Ypres, where the Allies desperately cling on and prevent a German breakthrough. There are more heavy losses on both sides. The two armies then dig in along the entire 350-mile front, seeking shelter from deadly machine gun fire and artillery shells. Trench warfare has begun. British warships win the first naval battle of the war at Heligoland Bight, sinking three German cruisers. Britain has the most powerful navy in the world, 29 modern battleships to Germany's 19. They now impose a naval blockade on Germany, preventing contraband goods, including food, from reaching it by sea. The aim is to bring Germany's economy to its knees and force it to surrender. But a week later, the British cruiser HMS Pathfinder becomes the first victim in history of a lethal new weapon, the submarine-launched torpedo. German submarines, or U-boats, have a surface range of 9,000 miles and can attack undetected from beneath the waves. They herald a deadly new challenge to Britain's command of the seas. Yeah, and naval technology has made massive, massive jumps leading into World War I. In fact, Britain has a fleet that is 20 years old, maybe, that has, it's completely obsolete by the start of World War I. It's scrapped, and all of these new ships are being put out there. But... Because these new ships are so technologically advanced and so cutting edge, they are also stupidly expensive. And so everybody is scared to death of losing their new massive ships. So what does Britain do? Britain kind of maneuvers their ships in a way where they're putting out more of their older ships and they're using their new ships in, in Scapa Flow and in other strategic places to enforce this blockade in case there was a major push made through one particular spot or another by the Germans. How do the Germans handle this? Well, they don't send out their ships to fight once. I think they send their ships out once during the entirety of the war. Instead, they use a different type of naval technology. They come up with the U-boats. And not only are they going to try to break the blockade with the U-boats, but they're going to start implementing their own blockade on the British. That's actually what's going to cause some major strife between neutral countries and Germany later in the war, is that there are neutral countries that are trading with the British. And those countries, the U.S., for example, the U.S. can't trade with Germany because the British have an embargo on Germany. And so they're stopping American ships. Even though America is neutral, they are stopping U.S. ships from trading with Germany, but they can still trade with the British. So then how does Germany respond to that? They start shooting 
U.S. merchant ships to keep them to to even it out to trade their not being able to trade with the U.S. Okay, well then now the British can't trade with the U.S. We're just going to sink U.S. ships. There are a lot of things specifically in World War One that Germany gets pinned with as being the quote unquote bad guy, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Propaganda was really really well done by the Entente. Uh, during the war, but also World War II leaves a stain on Germany that I think when you when you look at history and you're moving back, you just you think of all of kind of one collective historical Germany, unless you're going way back. And I think it taints the way that we look at World War I Germany because of World War II Germany, which, I feel like really isn't fair. Uh, there are a lot of things that Germany did because they were kind of pushed into a corner in World War One. This is not to say they didn't do any bad things, but all the belligerents did bad things in World War One. It, it was something that was not confined to the Germans, which is the way that it's talked about a lot. On the Eastern Front, Russian armies invade East Prussia. But they blunder into disaster at the Battle of Tannenberg, where General von Hindenburg and his chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff, mastermind a brilliant German victory, taking 90,000 prisoners and destroying an entire Russian army. And they're going to beat the brakes out of the Russian. They're going to beat the brakes out of the Russian so badly that they're eventually going to get moved to the Western Front because everything's going terribly on the Western Front, and they keep winning on the Eastern Front. The Russians contribute to their own defeat by transmitting uncoded wireless messages. A second massive German victory at Masurian Lakes forces the Russians into retreat. In just six weeks, the Russian army suffers nearly a third of a million casualties. Meanwhile, Austro-Hungary's invasion of Serbia suffers a humiliating reverse at the Battle of Tsar. Austro-Hungary's offensive against Russia also ends in disaster and retreat, with the loss of more than 300,000 men. The fortress town of Chemischul is cut off and besieged by the Russians. The Germans are forced to come to the rescue, launching a diversionary attack towards Warsaw. It leads to weeks of brutal winter fighting around the Polish city of Łódź, but there is no clear winner. Meanwhile, the Turkish Ottoman Empire has joined the Central Powers, declaring war on its old enemy, Russia. Turkish warships bombard the Russian ports of Odessa and Sevastopol, while in the Caucasus, Russian troops cross the Turkish frontier. So you have an argument in the, the Ottoman Empire on whether or not they are actually going to get into this war. And essentially, one of the sides that wants to go to war will, will basically just go shell Russia and then come back and then just kind of throw their hands up and be like, well, we shelled Russia, so now everybody doesn't have a choice but to get on board. And there's historical reasons for that. There's reasons why they hate Russia and Russia doesn't like them. But there is a sect within the Ottoman Empire that is like, we are not ready for a major war. And then they kind of have their hands tied on that. Beyond Europe, the war rages on the world's oceans and in far-flung European colonies. German troops cross into British East Africa, modern Kenya, and occupy Tavita, while Allied forces seize the German colony of Togoland, modern Togo. But British forces invading German Cameroon are defeated at Garoa and Nsangakong, while a 3,000 strong force attacking German Southwest Africa, modern Namibia, is captured at Sanfontaine. A month later, British landings at Tanga end in chaos and defeat, 
at the hands of a much smaller German force led by Colonel von Lettoff Wolbeck. Cut off from Germany, Lettoff Wolbeck goes on to wage a highly successful guerrilla war against the Allies, tying down huge numbers of troops. In Asia, Japan honours its treaty with Britain and declares war on Germany. Japanese forces go on to seize the German naval base at Tsingtao. The German colonies of Samoa and New Guinea surrender to troops from New Zealand and Australia. But in the Pacific, off the coast of Chile, German Admiral von Spee's powerful East Asia squadron sinks two British cruisers at the Battle of Coronel. Both ships are lost with all hands. If you want to see how well military leadership can do for a country when it goes to war, look at the German hierarchy of military leadership and the way it completely carries the country and specifically carries the Kaiser throughout World War I. They basically take control of the country. They have a plan for this. They are well prepared. The only... It, when you look at comparisons between World War I and World War II German militaries, the G World War II German military has way better equipment in comparison for the time. Their tactics are really, are really well done, but some of their leadership sucks. And the reason that some of their leadership sucks is because they have the ideological nature of Nazi Germany. And so it's not a merit-based system hardly ever it's specifically what you can do for the party or how much you support the party it's all of the things that go into nazism and that just seeps into every every part of german society particularly their military and political hierarchies you do have things like nepotism in world war one the the german hierarchy However, it is much, much more merit-based, and they had incredibly, incredibly great military leadership throughout a lot of, of World War I. Five weeks later, he runs into a British naval task force at the Falkland Islands. Four of the five German cruisers are sunk. Von Spee goes down with his flagship. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, British troops seize control of the Ottoman port of Basra, securing access to the vital Persian oil that fuels the British fleet. That winter, Austrian troops finally capture Belgrade. But the Serbs then counterattack and drive them back once more. The fighting in Serbia has already cost around 200,000 casualties on each side. In the North Sea, German warships mount a hit-and-run raid against English coastal towns, shelling Hartlepool, Whitby and Scarborough, and killing more than 100 civilians. On the Western Front, the French launch their first major offensive against the German lines. But the first Battle of Champagne leads to small gains at a cost of 90,000 casualties. While in the Caucasus, an Ottoman offensive through the mountains in midwinter ends in disaster at Sarikamish. Turkish casualties total 60,000, many frozen to death. Yeah, they, they sent that army up there without any winter clothing without anything they would need to fight in in cold temperatures much less extreme cold temperatures and so yeah they send a a pretty damn big force up there almost none of them come back the ones that do come back are half dead starving wounded almost frozen to death i mean they they basically kill an entire army just by negligence. They might as well have just killed them all themselves. That's how badly they handled that. On the Western Front, that first Christmas is marked in some sectors by a short truce, 
and games of football in no man's land. I like that the coat. Zone between the trenches. Okay, so that's Epic History TV's World War I 1914. Like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.